Our gospel this morning is so long, there wasn't room to put it in the bulletin. But it is a story that we know well. It is the story from John 20, verses 1 through 18. It's a story that starts early in the morning. Mary, who had loved Christ so dearly, wanted to have some time with Jesus alone. And even though he was dead, she wanted to go to the tomb so she could grieve by herself before the others came. So it was dark when she left for the tomb. It was that time of day when the blackness of night is just giving way to that blue-gray of morning. And she made her way there tearfully. But when she got there, things were not as they were supposed to be. When she had left, the stone was in place and it had been guarded by Roman centurions. But when she got there that morning, the stone, which would have taken many men to move, was, got, was moved out of place. And the guards were nowhere to be found. A quick peek told her that the tomb was empty. Frightened, confused, upset, she ran back to tell the disciples, the Lord is not there. Well, John, one of the younger disciples, healthy, energetic, he ran off at full speed. Peter, a little bit older, no less brash, but not quite as fast, trotted behind him. John got to the grave and got to the very precipice, and he looked in. Well, as Peter approached, he said, she's right, he's not there. Peter barely slowed down and went right on in. And he looked around him, and there were the grave clothes that had wrapped him here, the shroud. And over here was the cloth that had been covering his face. They were indeed there, but they were empty, as was the tomb. He came out, and John looked at him. Peter was the leader. Peter should have an answer. And all Peter could say is, he's not there. I don't know what it means. He said some things that were really strange before we left, before they took him. But he's surely not here. And John and Peter went back to that dark upper room where they were hiding so that no one would find them and maybe persecute them as well. But Mary was too distraught to go anywhere. And she stayed there looking at the tomb and she finally, through her tears, went up and, and looked in again. And when she looked in this time, it wasn't quite empty. There were two figures in white, dazzling white. And she could only stare, and they said, Woman, why are you weeping? Well, they took my Lord, and I wonder where he's gone. And just as she said that, she saw movement at the periphery of her vision. And she turned, and there was the gardener walking in the cool morning. And she turned to him and said, I don't know where they've taken him. And he said, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? And she said, my Lord, I'm looking for my Lord. And maybe he stepped a little differently or she stepped a foot closer and he said, Mary. And in that instant of hearing her name in his voice, she recognized, this is not the gardener. This is my Lord. And she rushed to him. And he probably took a step back and said, no, do not cling to me. But go to the others. Tell them that I am assenting to my Father and your Father, to my God and our God. Go tell them. And now, still with tears, but tears of joy, Mary ran back to that upper room and lit it up with her joy, saying, 
Brothers, sisters, I have seen the Lord. He is risen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. So, we often think it's strange. Mary, who knew the Lord so well, didn't recognize him. She mistook him for a gardener. But what if it wasn't a mistake? Because he was the gardener. John ends his gospel with two people walking in the garden. Kind of reminiscent of another garden eons before. When a woman was in the garden and Genesis 3 tells us that God walked. God walked in the garden that he had created. Hmm. He who creates a garden is called a what? A gardener. Hmm. So there, the great gardener walked in the cool of the day. Only the woman at that time was trying to hide from the gardener because she had done something wrong. But now, we have a garden again, and we have a divine gardener reaching out not to punish, not to accuse, but to say, I'm here, and it's new, and it's fresh, and it's not how you expect it. The garden is back. At his death, the last words attributed to Jesus in John's Gospel are, it is finished. And we might guess that Jesus is talking about his life, it's finished, his earthly life. It might be his mission is finished. I've done what I was called to do. And that is true. But it might also mean that the contaminated garden, the garden that we had to leave, the garden that we continued to sully, is finished. And on that first day, at the first light, creation is new. It is God's recreation of the garden, God's recreation of paradise, God's recreation of us. The old is done. And on this first day, when God created the heavens and the earth, Christ rises again, beckoning Mary to say, look, it's new. Don't look like you expected me to. And this new world might not look like you expected the new world to look like, but it is new. And every day you can arise and have it be new. Everything old can be washed away. Creation, you see, wasn't a one-time event. God is still working. Jesus says it a couple of times in John. Jesus is caught healing on the Sabbath, the day of rest. And Jesus' answer both times is, my father is still working and I am still working. God is still working and I am still working. Creation continues. Resurrection is not a one-time event. It keeps going and going. But we have to, like Mary, turn away from the past and look at what's new in different eyes. We can never get to the resurrection 
if we're hugging the tombstone, holding on to death. There are all kinds of deaths. As I was, as, as I was debating with some of my colleagues, as we were working through, what are we gonna say that's new this Easter? We looked at the scripture and, and, and there were, we were two divided camps. If it's not a bodily resurrection, then it doesn't count. Jesus has to get rid of death. He has to fix death. Okay? But we still die. So that didn't quite work. So there were the other of us who were saying, Jesus does fix death. But it doesn't mean we don't die. It means we don't need to be afraid of death because each death make space for a birth Amen. of something. Each death makes space for a new birth. It won't look like what we expected, but it will be something new. And we can talk about the caterpillar who goes in and dies and comes out so gloriously new. We can talk about losing a loved one and the grief and the real hurt of that. But even in that death, in time, we will see that something else was born. Space for something else will come when we are ready to let go and turn around. Something else will come. It won't look like what we wanted, but it will be more than we expected. One of the theologians, a process theologian, Whitehead, that I love, says that resurrection is perpetual perishing. Perpetual perishing. There always has to be a death so that life can come forth. I can't say what each of us individually must die to or let go of in order for new life to come to you this season. But I know there is, there is things that we corporately have to die to in order for something new to be born in us. There are things that we corporately as a community, as a nation, as humanity, have to let go of in order for the new to come forth. Noah is a really good movie for you to watch this season. It tinged some of what I was thinking as Noah watched the literal in his view, in the story's view, death of the world. And after the flood, new life, birth, a new garden that we wouldn't mess up this time. Oops. I left the movie thinking, oops. We didn't do so good. But I also left the movie thinking, but there's always another resurrection. God has set up a universe that has not just perpetual perishing, but per perpetual birthing as well. I ask as we go to silent meditation for you to think about what it is you can let go and ask God to help you see what new might express itself in unusual, unexpected ways. May God bless you this Easter with new life. Let us be in prayer.